Hello everyone. Um, I unfortunately have very little voice. I don't normally sound like this. And hopefully I will have a voice throughout the rest of this. Otherwise, Ben will have to come up here and give the rest of the talk for me, even though he doesn't run live games at all. So that will be really interesting. But yes, I'm going to be talking about chaos in live games um, and how you can embrace this and how you can kind of control this, or at least attempt to. But before I do that, I'm going to talk a little bit about me, because that's a good way to start. So I just completed an MFA in live game design. And while I was doing that, I found my way into games by running them through Cecil games in random places around London, such as Decompression, which is an indoor festival, Rumpus, which is another indoor festival, and learned how to run games for people who were generally intoxicated, which was a really fun experience. <laughs> Um, after that, I a couple, like this past summer, I finally, I got, well, not finally, I was only doing this for a while, but I got a full-time job actually doing this for a living with Firehazard Games, um, which is really exciting. And that is a picture of me looking really serious, um, but it relates to Firehazard Games because that's for one of the games. But for live games, chaos is inherent. You have players that create half of the script while the game is going on. So you can kind of go, well, I think the game is going to go like this, and I have these parameters in place, and I have these non-player characters, and I've given them these briefings. And then you have, especially at places like Rumpus, where there's thousands of, like there's a thousand people, and everyone is otherwise uh, situated. Um, they will instead go, you know what, I like the storyline, but I have confetti. And I'm going to completely change this now and go overthrow the Empress you've put over there. And that's the new storyline. And you go, great. Well, that's your storyline, but luckily there's, thousands, there's a thousand other people, so they're probably not going to realize this. But you just don't know what's going to happen. Um, and but while, before I talk more about why live games are chaotic, I'm going to kind of explain my job. Because I realize that not many people run live games. So what I do is I'm part stage manager, part de-escalation person, because my players are right in front of me, and they're not always happy, and, not, and generally for reasons I cannot control. I'm part... Um, cast mother, making sure all of the actors are super happy. I am part... Wait, I'm losing my... This is the only part I have notes for because I get really confused about what my job actually is. Uh, and apparently I folded it very, very well. Right, okay. Oh yes, I, run, I design games. That is a thing that I do. <laughs> Excellent. Um, part dungeon master, because the game is happening in real time, so you're actually having to go, the players did what? Okay, well, in this case, run protocol, whatever, 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 or more likely, improvise, but think you're on a spaceship. Um, and then part god, because, yes, I, the world that I'm creating is mine, and you are my players. Continuing on. The main um, games that I'm going to talk about to kind of talk about how chaos can either be embraced or controlled are Rumpus, which is an indoor festival, and Raiders of the Lost Archive, which I run for Firehazard Games, which runs in the V&A Museum. These are very different venues with very different players and very different needs. Rumpus. So Rumpus, as I already mentioned, is about a thousand players in Islington Metalworks. It starts at 10 p.m. and ends at 6 in the morning. And we run the games generally from 11 until about 2.30, at which point you can't run anything because no one can follow a direction. <laughs> and then we're trying a new thing on Friday where I'm going to start the game again at 4 in the morning and end it at 6 a.m. because I've heard that people are again able to do things again. So we'll see how that works. I'm not sure how well I can do things 
between 4 and 6 in the morning doing all of the jobs I previously mentioned. Although I don't have to do any of the de-escalation stuff because it's Santi's event and Santi can handle that. But yes, so Rumpus has... Oh, how do I describe Rumpus? Well, it's got circus, live music, some of them being mariachi bands playing metal music, some of them being kazoo orchestras. There are like salsa and swing dance classes that randomly happen. There are some bits of interactive theater. I once crawled through a tunnel to a complaint agency who talked to me about bagpuss. But I'm American, so I have no idea what that was. <laughs> it was very confusing. Um, and then gave me a silver bowl with rum in it and got very, and they had to track me down later because they weren't supposed to do that. And then when I'm involved, there's live games. And it's a kind of a challenge because when you have a thousand people running through a seven room warehouse, you can't make a, please start here. Your adventure begins now because they're just going to kind of wander around and go, that's a cool thing. I'm going to go talk to that person. So you'll have a lovely story, and they'll go, ah, that's six stages along. What do I do now? So you have to make the story make sense no matter where they start and then whatever they decide to do, which makes it instead of like a nice linear kind of like, um, if you read um, Emily Short, I believe it, her name is, uh, kind of like narrative structures, like most of those don't really work. It's kind of, I think it's like open map, um, where you have lots of stages and it kind of circles around. It's kind of like that if you add in parallel dimensions and wibbly wobbly space time and spiders and lots of other things. Kind of how this started is I decided to be a unicorn at endless at um, decompression in November a year like a year and a half ago. And I was like, and I made a little kind of tiny quest. It didn't really work. It was it kind of failed. Ten people finished it though. Ten people were able to be sober enough to get to the end, and they became knights, and they were super proud of it. I also didn't realize that there's a unicorn subculture at this point. And knowing that now, it has made a lot of my interactions that evening make a lot more sense. <laughs> so as is kind of a re recurring story, I then went to R Santi, who runs Rumpus. I was like, hey, I did this thing for decompression. I had a lot of fun. Can I run a quest at your event? At which point he said, yes, but how about for the London Games Festival, last year, we turned the entire venue into a live game, and that's the entire theme. I think I can go back, as you can see, pick your own misadventure, and that's what we will do. Can, can you do that? And I said, yes. And we did it. It was awesome, and extremely chaotic, as previously mentioned, and I was a little naive of what I was supposed to do, and does it just, how do I make this play? No. Now, I'm trawling through the Rumpus universe to find my way out to the Barbarian battle, where I'm going to slay everyone and take home that Eurovision crown. Have you heard of a Barbarian zone? Ah! Donde esta? Ah, el Barbarian zone! Si. Is it In the unclean pits of the unwashed! Beyond the halls of Neverbroth! Oh. And a strange challenge has been bestowed upon me. My weapon is a balloon. How will I utilize this weapon in my battle? It's a balloon of the royal
With Sorry, Ben. <laughs> As you can see, Rumpus is extremely chaotic. Oh, um. And I learned lots of things from it. One is I under underestimated them, and I didn't make an ending for the first rumpus because I didn't think anyone was going to get there. They did, and they were angry. <laughs> and so they blew up my big barbarian bash with confetti and took over the empress, which is throne, which was a pretty beautiful ending because they kind of took what I made and like, they made something from it, but at the same time, that was kind of my fault. I should have had an ending. Um, and people got really excited. I was like, oh, there's mariachi bands playing metal music. Who's going to get excited about what I'm doing? I was wrong. They got excited. Also, this is important. If you put an actor in a cupboard, make sure they do not have a bottle of ginger wine or two. This gets messy. Uh, your NPCs will often have just as much fun as your players. Um, this is not really on chaos, it's just really fun things that I learned. Because I have my actors often come back and go, Hey, you're doing another cool thing, can I be in it? And I go, I only have six people that I can have in it, but I will try. My voice worked really well for that. Good job, voice. Uh, you want something that swishes, you feel really cool when there's a thousand people playing your game right there. And you go, yes, I made this. And yes, and it will always pretty much go fine because all of the people there are lovely and you can, listen, you can play, listen, like dance to the mariachi band because the mariachi band's really good. But yes, which is when we've done another one in November. We're doing one t on Friday, which is mostly planned and slightly retro space age running man themed and should be fun. But moving back to chaos. Um, while, where in Rumpus, I've really embraced chaos. In Raiders, in the V&A Museum, chaos is not an option. The V&A Museum like risk assessments. <laughs> and they like to know that their visitors, their exhibits, and their staff are not going to be disturbed. Now, I didn't design Raiders. I joined Firehazard Games after this was already designed. I've helped kind of tweak it and develop it a bit, but I've run it a lot. And at this point, it's, it has lots of safety features, like you have teams of less than five. The clues are randomized. So they're not going to be in the same place most of the time. So you don't have like five teams looking at an artifact going, ooh, this is really interesting. And a visitor's like, I would really like to see that at some point. Or worse, you have five teams huddling in a doorway because there's a really cool set of gems and no one can get in or out of that room. That is a fire risk. VNAs don't, the VNA does not like fire risks, especially when you can block cameras in very precious jewelry rooms. That's not a good thing. Yes. But yes, yeah, so at this point, Raiders um, is essentially bulletproof. Um, I, ha <laughs> I can see Gwyn, my boss, looking very uncomfortable at the back. <laughs> but well, at this point, it's essentially bulletproof. We've made it so that it's very difficult for the players to be chaotic themselves. They're, not, they're repeatedly reminded not to run in character and out of character. They're incentivized not to run. They're definitely not incentivized to move quickly. Uh, they are... You... We make it, like the way it's the whole mechanics are set up is so that they can act in as least chaotic way as possible and win and feel like lady and gentlemanly explorers who do not deal with rolling boulders or giant snakes. I know. But do you want to write the risk assessment of a giant boulder in the V&A? <laughs> or snakes? I don't. Now, besides players, there's another thing that can get very difficult and chaotic, and that is the general public. 
So for Shadow, which is a Victorian horror game, which only runs when the sun like goes down at four in the like in the afternoon, because it's hard to have Shadow like kind of scary things when there's a bright sun that makes things difficult. But also, when you have complete and total darkness, you can have teenagers, and teenagers are chaotic and sometimes can have pen knives. So that means you have to put in a completely different set of parameters and safety measures to make sure that the, pu the general public is kept to as least chaotic of a state as you possibly can, which definitely goes back to risk assessments, which are really useful in hindsight. I mean, you have them to begin with, but you don't know what all the risks are yet. I, there are things that before Shadow, I would not have expected at all. I would not have put old ladies who like to walk through the park as one of my most chaotic elements, but they are. They really are. So it's that kind of thing, like trying to balance where you embrace chaos, something like Rumpus, where you want to make sure that your game can withstand pretty much anything the players can throw at it and your, your actors can kind of jump in on that. Or where you go, okay, we want to make sure that everyone's having fun, but we want to make sure that the venue is also happy and it fits within that kind of like the venue event purview. And so, I think purview is the right word. I, tr I used taciturn earlier and it did not mean what it thought it meant. It means to be quiet. I didn't know that. I thought it meant to be like, confusingly emotional, like where you're like, yeah, it's not. It really isn't. Um, yes. Yes, thank you. So you want to make sure that whatever your game you're designing, this is what we, I think about a lot, is that it fits within what kind of area you're setting in and what kind of, and trying to figure out what elements of chaos are going to be your friends and are going to be your foes. Also, risk assessments are your friends. That's kind of a big thing. And thank you.